You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Welcome to Fresh Hell. I'm Annie. And I'm Johanna, and we're so happy to have you here. We really are. Let's see. Is there anything that we need to discuss before we get started today? Um, no, not from my end, at least not that I can think of anything. Okay. So I thought that it was time for a ghost story. And in this case, it's a place I've been to several times. And because so many of us are still staying home due to the pandemic, it's not a house. It's not even a schloss or a burg. <laughs> it's a lighthouse. It's uh, the St. Augustine Lighthouse, to be exact. I love a lighthouse. I love lighthouses. I always wanted to go to a lighthouse. Never been near one. Yes, we'll have to add that to the list when you come to visit, because we have a lot of really good lighthouses around New England and Cape Cod especially. I think they do look pretty, but often in kind of a creepy way. <laughs> uh, and of course, the disappearance of the lighthouse keepers on Flannan Isle is mm. on our cases to cover list. Uh, what else? Oh, the movie, The Lighthouse. Amazing. Go watch it. It's Robert Eggers, who's also directed The Witch, which is another amazing movie. Go watch that one too. Uh, and I think that's all I have on lighthouses. That's, that, that's my whole expertise. <laughs> that's the Robert Pattinson movie, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Is it scary? Uh, the Lighthouse movie. Well, yeah. Uh, I, I, me personally, I wouldn't call it scary. It's kind of, was the witch scary to you? I didn't see it. It looked too scary. <laughs> Wait, you went to school in St. Augustine, right? I did. Yeah. I went to Flagler College for my undergraduate, which itself was very haunted. And Paul and I were married in St. Augustine at the Casa Monica Hotel, which when I was in school, that building was used for town offices, but it was purchased and rehabbed back to its former hotel glory after I graduated. They did a beautiful job with it, and it's where the royal family of Spain stays when they visit uh, St. Augustine, and I recommend it very much. So my plan today is... A little bit of Florida and St. Augustine history, because it is the oldest city in the United States, or I should say very specifically, it is the oldest continually occupied European settlement in the United States. That's impressive. Well, yeah, it's, and there is a difference, right? Because there were other things that started and failed before, but yeah. yeah. So yeah, brief history of the area, which actually feels like a lot, uh, but I promise I've left out so much. You know how I am. I kept finding information that I hadn't known before researching for this episode, and I had to include it. And I'll probably do uh, several other St. Augustine episodes as we do this podcast. So at least now the basics will be done. You know what I mean? Oh, then we'll talk about the lighthouses. There have been two, and the deaths associated with the lighthouses and the apparitions seen most often on the premises. You know, I do love Florida, so I'm very excited to learn something new today. But before we start, are there any warnings? No, I don't think so. We're going to talk about history and colonial expansion. So mistreatment of Native peoples. We're going to be discussing slavery, as well as some of the details of the deaths of people who are thought to be haunting the lighthouse. And some of them are children, but there are no murders, no gory details. Knowing me, there'll probably be some swearing, but I'd say this episode is solidly PG. Okay, sounds like this will be an interesting episode and just the right amount of creepy for us. <laughs> I hope so. Unless Unless you yourself are currently living in a haunted lighthouse and you don't have a good relationship with whoever is haunting you, then you might want to skip this one for now. And then also with your free time, please write to us and tell us everything because <laughs> I love a haunted lighthouse. All right. So now we're going to go way, way back because this starts with Juan Ponce de Leon and he was one of the earliest Spaniards to arrive in St. Augustine. Born in 1474 to a noble family in Valladolid, Spain, he had been a part of Christopher Columbus's second journey to the Americas, and he had gone as a gentleman volunteer and became a high-ranking political figure in Hispaniola, which was the name for the island that is today uh, modern-day Haiti and the Dominican Republic. He and his men had crushed the native Tano people in an uprising, and because of his successes, he was named governor of 
of the eastern province of Hispaniola. He had land and a title and slaves, and he made money selling mostly livestock, cattle, and some produce to ships that were returning to Spain. So things were going well, but he still liked very much to explore. When the king heard that there might be gold on the nearby island of Puerto Rico... Yeah, with a name like Puerto Rico, so rich port, I can only imagine why why he would have thought that. <laughs> I know, right? So Ponce de Leon was allowed to do some more exploring for Spain, which is how he ends up in Puerto Rico. And, oh, so the island at that time was called... San Juan Baptista by the Spanish, so named after St. John the Baptist. Almost everything is named after a saint or a festival. So anyway, in 1508, he goes on an official exploration, and he was then later made governor of Puerto Rico by King Ferdinand of Spain. Isabella, his wife, uh, had died in 1504, but their daughter, Catherine of Aragon, would be Henry VIII's first wife. And a year later, in 1509, Henry and Catherine are married, and they will rule England. And that is definitely a story for another day. I just wanted to sort of set the time period for everybody, because because a lot of people know, you know, Henry VIII. And so then you can kind of imagine parallel time. Yeah. If that makes, makes sense. sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so in Puerto Rico, Juan Ponce de Leon is doing well. He's got a wife and kids, property, and of course, he has native slaves to work the land. But he and Diego Colon, who was Christopher Columbus's son, they have some sort of it seems like some kind of serious man issues over who should control the island. So Diego Colon is like, my dad found this continent and I'm his heir, so now it's mine. And Juan Ponce de Leon is like, no, the Vikings were here before your dad. I found this place and my slaves worked really hard and this is mine. And so this kind of stuff goes on for a while and everyone is miserable. And so finally the king of Spain is like, you know what? Uh, why don't you go on and go exploring? again, Juan, because he does enjoy it very much. And so he goes, he fucks off probably in a huff, uh, and he heads north to do some exploring. So in 1513, he leaves Puerto Rico, uh, sets sail and ends up near present day St. Augustine in northeast Florida. And he claimed that land for Spain, and he named it La Florida, which means land of the flowers. That is where some believed that he had found the fountain of youth. There is a natural spring there, and the area when they arrived was, of course, occupied by the native people and had been for a very long time. So today you can visit this. It's the Fountain of Youth Archaeological Park. You can try the water from the natural spring. And there's there's actually a lot to see and do of historical interest. And it's on the water. It's lovely. But mostly in native, early Native American life, Spanish colonization. They fire a cannon every day and have demonstrations and reenactments. And how is the spring water? Okay, so having had the water from the Fountain of Youth on a couple of occasions, it tastes... It's like the purest sulfur that you th I think you only find in hell in Florida. It's like... <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That just pure sulfur water. There are probably other places in Florida where water tastes like that, but it's tough. Yeah. So it doesn't taste great. It won't hurt you, though. I'm aging like it's my body's new goal in life. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend the water for youth and beauty purposes. But the site itself is definitely lovely and educational. And they have peacocks that you can feed. So go check it out if you can. Definitely recommend it. So Ponce de Leon made his way south along the coast. He named Cape Canaveral for the strong currents that he encountered sailing past that area. And then he kept on going south until he reached the Florida Keys and the islands that he named the Dry Tortugas. So Tortugas means turtles, and it was named that because there were a lot of turtles around, and dry was the term he used when he found no source of fresh water on the island. He then made his way up the west coast of Florida before encountering during the Calusa. So they were known as the Shell Indians and had lived in southwest Florida for millennia. They were known to be good sailors and they would often salvage shipwrecks. And they were not amused when Juan and his party arrived. And when they let the conquistador know that they were most unwelcome, Ponce de Leon and his people fucked off back to Puerto Rico. Not out of courtesy, just in case that's not clear. So he later tried to bring a group of potential settlers. So two ships with a couple of hundred men, farm equipment, some livestock, and he schlepped all this to 
to Florida in 1521. But those same Calusa people who had chased them off previously were like, are you fucking kidding me? So now a lot of the history books say that they attacked Juan and the settlers, but I'm going to go ahead and say that they defended the land that their people had lived on and cared for for millennia, and so the settlers noped out of there as fast as they could. Ponce de Leon was wounded during this uh, skirmish, and he would actually die in Cuba from his injuries and later be buried in Puerto Rico. But his legacy lives on in a million things named after him. My college was actually originally a Gilded Age luxury hotel built by railroad magnate Henry Flagler. Just the dining hall alone is just a giant circular room, and all of the windows are original Louis Comfort Tiffany. Presidents and dignitaries stayed there. My dorm room was actually a two-bedroom suite with a common study area, a private bathroom for the six of us, and my bedroom had a carved marble fireplace in it, so it was pretty amazing. But no air conditioning and no interdorm visitation, so, you know, downsides. The name of the hotel was the Hotel Ponce de Leon. So it's now Flagler College, and most recently, I think people call it America's Hogwarts. I'll post some photos. If you're a fan of the arts, you just, you're going to love it. But yeah, Ponce de Leon's name is all over Florida and probably all over Puerto Rico because he was the first governor there. Okay, so to recap, this part of Florida has been inhabited for thousands of years by native peoples, then explored and claimed for Spain by Juan Ponce de Leon. But now we're going to flash forward 50 years to Pedro Menendez de Aviles. He was a conquistador from Asturias, Spain, who had claimed, named, and settled St. Augustine for the Spanish crown. So if you're ever in Asturias, which is where he was from, it's in the northwest of Spain. You must eat at La Zamorana. It's in Gijón. It's the best restaurant in the province. Also, there's a town in Florida named for Oviedo, which is the capital of Asturias, but they pronounce it Oviedo. And apparently there's a, a movement to try and get people to pronounce it correctly, which I support. It's so different. Obiedo, Obido, like they've left out an entire, it's... Yeah, you know me and you know I'm all for trying to pronounce things correctly. Cough, cough, Adidas. <laughs> uh, it also reminds me of the Versailles in Indiana, our friend Erica told us about. Yeah, but they pronounce it Versailles. Versailles. Oh yeah, right, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, place names are ridiculous, aren't they? There are some really funny YouTube videos about this, and I'm going to post some in the Facebook group. Don't worry, I'm going to start with the ones that make fun of Massachusetts. I'm not throwing stones, they're just you know, universally terrible. I'm waiting for all the angry messages from Ovi or Oviedo and Versailles. Yeah. As long as we don't get any from Oviedo and Versailles, we'll be fine. <laughs> oh, I thought of another one. So Warwick, uh, Rhode Island, is named after Warwick, England, where there's a lovely castle. Spelled the same, pronounced differently, uh, but Worcestershire is the same. It's the same everywhere. All right. Back to the founding of St. Augustine on September 8th. 1565, when Pedro Menendez de Aviles arrived on the shore of what is now called Mantanzas Bay. Wait, sorry, uh, Mantanzas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to our non-Spanish speaking listeners, Mantanzas is a massacre or slaughter. So it's Massacre Bay. I can actually see why they kept the name in <laughs> Spanish. And you know, see, that's the thing. The most horrible things, they sound lovely in Spanish, right? Yeah. While the most beautiful thing sounds super scary in German. And yes, I'm looking at you, Schmetterling. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's butterfly, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when Pedro Menendez arrived, it is important to note that, of course, he arrived in an area that was already an ancient settlement by the native Timucua people. And listen, I'm not saying that the entire area of land inhabited by modern day St. Augustine is just all built on ancient Native American holy land or burial grounds, but I'm also not saying it's not. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> So Menendez, though, he had a job to do. So Philip II of Spain had sent General Pedro Menendez de Aviles to get the French out of Florida. 
Spain had already claimed Florida, as we all know, but the Protestant French Huguenots had the audacity to build a fort known as Fort Caroline. It was either in Jacksonville or possibly as far north as South Georgia. There's still, I think, some question about exactly where it was located, but it's not important for today's story. So Spain had already developed lots of colonies in Central and South America, and they were worried about this French colony because they could be a threat to the treasure ships that Spain had sailing past the coast of Florida on the regular. Also, religion, of course, played no small part because Catholic Spain wanted these heathen Huguenots gone. Long story short, er, the French had had bad luck with a hurricane and uh, supplies, and no one expected the Spanish Inquisition. Yeah, they never do. You never. So, yeah, ultimately, it really was a massacre. It was bad, like bodies hanging from trees as an example, kind of bad scenario. Very Game of Thrones. Oh, and apparently there was also a very Khaleesi moment where the Spanish chaplain, Francisco Mendoza, he offered to spare the life of any Catholics or any who would convert to Catholicism. But of course, the French Protestants refused and they ended up killing almost everyone except for a handful of folks who escaped, a handful of women and children, and a few others that they either pressed into service aboard the ships or took with them to keep as uh, they had skills necessary to help established the Spanish fort that was about to be built. But the incredibly brutal treatment of the French colonists was said to have made the bay run red with blood, and that is why it is to this day called Mantanzas Bay. And now it's this very romantic waterfront with a little bed and breakfasts and restaurants like Harry's where I had my graduation lunch and A1A Ale Works and the Santa Maria restaurant where you can feed the fish while you dine and horse-drawn carriages and ghost tours. Horse-drawn ghost tours? Yeah, you bet. It's good stuff. So it really is pretty, though. And the Spanish would construct a fort, the Castillo de San Marcos, which is, of course, the oldest remaining fortress of 17th century military construction. And we took some wedding photos near there. It's really, it's very pretty. And it's made of coquina, which we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So you get the idea. It's an old city. St. Augustine was the capital of Spanish Florida for over 200 years. There were raids on the English colony of Jamestown by the more established St. Augustine, and the colonists in St. Augustine were regularly being attacked in a long series of battles for control with the native people, with other colonies. There were issues with pirates. In 1763, it became a territory of Great Britain after Britain defeated Spain and France in the Seven Years' War. Spain ceded the land to England in exchange for Cuba and the Philippines. When this happens, most of the Spanish St. Augustinians are just like, these people can't season food. We're out of (laughs) here. (laughs) <laughs> Palawago. Seriously, though, they had they had to evacuate a city that they'd spent 200 years building. And so they evacuated and left for Cuba and other Caribbean islands. And they had to leave. They weren't happy about it. One story I read said that they dismantled the homes and even took away the nails, which I kind of hope that's true because I'm a fan of historical spite facts. I like... <laughs> Like a good spiting. All right. So Florida became Great Britain's 14th and 15th North American colonies. And during the American Revolutionary War, Florida remained loyal to England. And then there was a second Spanish period before it became the uh, 27th state in 1845. Florida did not support Lincoln in the presidential election, and his anti-slavery agenda was a real problem. And Florida was the third state to leave the Union, and so they joined with the Confederacy to fight against the United States in the American Civil War. They needed to try to keep the slaves that were keeping the massive Florida plantations making that money. And that is where I found information about Fort Mose. Fort Mose was created by the Spanish governor of Florida, Manuel Montiano, in 1738. It was a free black settlement, and it was the first in what would become the United States. And slaves who had escaped from the Carolinas and Georgia were directed to St. Augustine, and they were actually aided in their escape by Native Americans, who were responsible for the first underground railroad in what is now the United States. So I would love to do an entire episode 
episode on Fort Mose. The full name is actually the Gracia Real de Santa Teresa Mose. The men there were part of an important militia protecting the north of the city, because when they arrived, of course, their freedom was conditional. They had to convert to Roman Catholicism, and any able-bodied man had to serve in the militia for a period of four years. But of course, that was easy enough to do in exchange for your freedom and your life. It's almost literally cake or death, right? So Mm -hmm. these free slaves uh, formed alliances with the local Native American people and the local colonists. They were given land on which they could build homes and farm and raise families. And when control passed from Spain to England and those Spanish colonists all left, so did all of the free Africans from Fort Mose because the treaty in 1821 made Florida a U.S. territory, more specifically a slave territory. So most of the men, women, and children fled Florida for Cuba by the Bahamas and other parts of the Caribbean to avoid being forced back into slavery. If you have a chance to visit this incredibly interesting and educational state park, it's got an accessible visitor center and boardwalks, there are reenactments, and there's a great PBS video and kids book about Fort Mose. I'm going to link to those in our sources. But I should also mention, if I understood this correctly, when we talk about slavery in this particular place and time period, It's complicated. And make no mistake, we both absolutely condemn slavery of any kind. It's just in this circumstance, it's not as black and white as you would think. I didn't mean to use that phrase, but it actually fits. What I mean is it wasn't what we think of in terms of pre-Civil War in the United States. I think most of us probably just think, you know, when we think of that time period that we think of, you know, all black people being slaves, all white people, you know, being free. Yeah. Right. But during this time period, it seems that there were free black men on both Ponce de Leon and Menendez's crew, but then they did have slaves who were usually Native American. And then sometimes the Native Americans would capture shipwrecked colonials that were both white and black and make them slaves. And I'm not in any way meaning to diminish the long and horrific history of the enslavement of the African people. It's just at this time period, it seems like everyone was looking for humans to enslave, which I mean, that's been going on since at least biblical times, right? I will tell you the most fucked up fact I found out about slavery in Florida was the fact that the last slaves in Florida, guess what year? It technically became illegal with the 13th Amendment in 1865. So when do you think slavery ended in Florida? Uh, Jesus, I don't know. If you say it like this, it must have been late, maybe uh, 1900. Mm -hmm. That's a good guess. 1942. What? My mother was born in 1942, and she just passed away at the age of 77. Yeah. So here's what happened, because I can't not share this. So Khalil Gibran Mohammed, he wrote a piece for the New York Times 1916 project, which I highly recommend. So he writes, quote, In 1942, the Department of Justice began a major investigation into the recruiting practices of one of the largest sugar producers in the nation, the United States Sugar Corporation, a South Florida company. Black men unfamiliar with the brutal nature of the work were promised seasonal sugar jobs at high wages only to be forced into debt peonage, immediately accruing the cost of their transportation, lodging, and equipment, all for $1.80 a day. One man testified that the conditions were so bad, quote, it wasn't no freedom, it was worse than the pen, end quote. Federal investigators agreed. When workers tried to escape, the FBI found that they were captured on the highway or, quote, shot at while trying to hitch rides on the sugar trains, end quote. The company was indicted by a federal grand jury in Tampa for carrying out a conspiracy to commit slavery, wrote Alec Wilkerson in his 1989 book, Big Sugar, Seasons in the Cane Fields of Florida, end quote. It reminds me of human trafficking that is still happening today. I mean, slavery is mm-hmm. still happening today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And yeah, that's where I'm going to end the slavery portion of today's episode. I just kept finding these facts out that just, I was just kind of stunned by a lot of this and inspired by some of it. I just don't think I could have skipped any of it. It's just not a simple story. And so now I'm looking for more books on this very complex topic. I'm guessing my dad has some. I'm absolutely sure he does. Yeah. 
So there's more and lots more, obviously. But we need to get to the lighthouse. But I just wanted to be clear that this area had a long bloody history, decimation of native people, slavery, wars I haven't even mentioned. You can certainly understand why a city with this much history would be positively overflowing with spooky fuckery. Mm -hmm. And it is. It really is. But it's worth it because it's a beautiful part of the country. And honestly, I could do 10 episodes on just the history of St. Augustine, but I won't. It's out there if you want more information. Most people, when they think of Florida, they think of Orlando because for most of the world, including most of the United States, that may be the only place that you would visit if you're not within driving distance, right? It would just be a trip to Disney World. Yeah. Yeah. But if you get the chance, St. Augustine is... It's a really beautiful city, and it's a city, but it feels more like a small coastal town. Uh, I think that's why it appealed to me so much growing up on Cape Cod. We hosted a student from Spain when I was in high school, and we just got along so well that my sister and I spent a summer there before my last year of high school. We spent a summer with her family in Asturias. And so when I visited St. Augustine as a prospective student, I just, I fell in love with the very Spanish-feeling town. Red tile roofs and narrow cobbles stone streets. It's a very European feeling town uh, in the United States. And it's just, it's on the water. It reminded me of home. There's a bridge, a drawbridge that spans the intercoastal waterway or Mentenzas Bay. And it connects A1A on the mainland St. Augustine to Anastasia Island. This bridge is known as the BOL or Bridge of Lions, which is named for the two large stone lions that are on the mainland side. This bridge was constructed in the 20s. In the early days, it was like it's probably rowboats. And then at one point, there was a terrifying looking wooden bridge. Really makes me uncomfortable just looking at photos of it. I'll post one. <laughs> and I think the year I graduated college, so 1999, it was declared structurally deficient. Remember that conversation we had about all mm-hmm. the bridges? Mm-hmm. So they just finished a huge renovation of it in 2010. Uh, so it's once again, safe to drive on. But it's a real bummer if you're trying to get to class and a boat's going through. We're now going to talk about the lighthouse, but first, we need to take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Payoff.com is a paying sponsor of this Fresh Hell podcast. You've tried balance transfers and budgeting, but high interest rates and unrelenting bill cycles make it almost impossible to get out of credit card debt on your own. Instead of another new savings technique, you need a clear path out of debt. And that's what a payoff loan can do. A payoff loan is a personal loan backed by member-centric credit unions designed to help you pay off your credit cards with rates as low as 5.99% APR and loan amounts up to $35,000 with no hidden fees and personal customer service support from payoff to help you reach your financial goals. Some of the benefits of a payoff loan may also include potential credit score boost, one monthly payment, and savings from lower interest rates. Go to payoff.com slash fresh hell podcast to learn more. Checking loan rates won't affect your credit score. Try something new. Pay off your credit card debt with payoff. NMLS ID number 1396805. Not all applicants may qualify. Loans only available within the United States. Loan is not available in all states. Payoff works with lending partners who originate the loans. Additional terms, conditions, and eligibility requirements may apply. More information is available at payoff dot com slash fresh hell podcast. Okay, so that was a paid advertisement. Now let's talk about the St. Augustine Lighthouse history. And a lot of this is from the St. Augustine Lighthouse website. I believe a lot of this part was written by Paul Zielinski. They have a great educational website that we will link to. I assure you, you'll want to visit it. So as I said, across the BOL, Bridge Lions, is Anastasia Island, where the lighthouse was located. Now the first lighthouse was a wooden tower built by the Spanish to watch for approaching ships, more of like a watchtower. Then one day, in 1586, Sir Francis Drake himself sails on by. So he had been sent by Queen Elizabeth I, Henry VIII's badass daughter, to both damage as much Spanish-held territory as possible and then replenish the colony at Roanoke. So he's sailing by and he sees the watchtower and the fort and he's like, oh, this must be St. Augustine. We should sack it. (laughs) And they did. And so then the lighthouse was rebuilt in 1737, and this time it was built out of native coquina stone, which I mentioned earlier. I'm not sure stone is the right 
word to use. So coquina is a soft limestone, sort of, and it's made up of broken shells and fossils and things in the soil. It's native. <laughs> It's native. To the, follow me for more geology tips. It's native to the area, but I think it's pretty rare in terms of globally. And it's really, really soft and it needs to be dried out for a very long time to be workable. I think like years you need to dry it out before it's usable. But once you do all of this and you build with it, it's very strong, but also surprisingly and kind of weirdly shock absorbent. The Castillo de San Marcos, the fort, is built of coquina and it's got coquina walls. And there are places where you can see where maybe an English ship in the harbor fired a cannonball at the fort and it hit the fort and rather than break a piece off like you would expect right you imagine you know you've seen it in movies you know a cannonball hits and a chunk of mortar and whatever it is yeah. stone goes flying well with coquina it just got like stuck in the wall i wish you could see i'm like punching my hand with my fist like just whoop. and then now there it'd just be stuck in the wall or it would sort of like bounce off. And then the Spanish would come out during like downtime uh, of sieges and collect all those cannonballs and then fire them back at their own ammo at their enemies in the harbor. So the city took a lot of heavy attacks, but I think the fort pretty much always held. And part of that was the coquina stone. And there are a play few places in St. Augustine where you can see it. It's, it's cool. So Florida became a territory of the United States in 1821. Remember, that's when the Spanish colonists and the free Africans left for Cuba and the Bahamas. And when it did, the United States government decided that St. Augustine needed a better lit coastline because there have been a lot of wrecks in this area. Like a lot, a lot. In fact, on the night of New Year's Eve, 1782, uh, approximately 16 ships that were being used by the British to evacuate Charlestown, or as we know it now, Charleston, South Carolina, they all were shipwrecked during a nor'easter following the American victory in the Revolutionary War. The Lighthouse Museum has a history uh, exhibit about this, so check it out if you go. So they inspected the watchtower, and they were like, this isn't a lighthouse, it's a watchtower. And so Congress approved $5,000 to build a new lighthouse. And on March 25th, 1824, the lighthouse was operational with, quote, 10 patent lamps and 10 14-inch reflectors, end quote. The first keeper of Florida's first United States lighthouse was Juan Andreu. He was the son of indentured servants from Menorca, island off the coast of Spain, who had traveled by foot. And if I've calculated this right, so his parents walked the 70 miles north to St. Augustine when the owner of their plantation... He was a nightmare human being. He had fled for Charleston. He was apparently bad enough of a plantation owner in a time when they were all pretty awful, right? But he and his overseers were known to be just absolute monsters. And his slaves and indentured servants were dying from disease and neglect and abuse. And so they had had it. And they they actually started a march north to St. Augustine for sanctuary. And they received it. And he had fled. So lots of this information, again, is from the Lighthouse website, and it says, quote, Juan was the first of many Menorcan keepers at the St. Augustine Lighthouses. As the first, he also holds the distinction of being the first Hispanic American to serve in the Coast Guard and the first to oversee a federal installation of any kind, end quote. Juan served as keeper until 1845. So in case there are any Lighthouse fans, you know we've got Lighthouse fans in this group, right? I mean, definitely, definitely. Yeah. definitely. Yeah. So apparently the earliest lamps in the first tower, they just burned lard oil. And then they used several with silver reflectors to make the light visible until 1855, when it was replaced by a fourth order Fresnel lens, which helped with both maintenance and had a much more powerful beam of light. So the new light was installed when Juan Andro's cousin, Joseph or Jose Andro, was the keeper. He had handled light keeping duties for a year, um, having started in 1854 when tragedy struck. 
The Lighthouse website says, quote, Joseph attended the light until tragedy struck when the scaffolding from which he was painting the tower failed. The December 10th, 1859 edition of the St. Augustine Examiner tells that Joseph, quote, first struck the roof of the oil room about 30 feet below, whence he glanced off and struck the stone wall, which encloses the lighthouse, and thence to the ground, killing him instantly. End quote. That's awful. Awful. I know. It's, uh, I don't do lights, and I hate having anyone I know on a ladder, never mind scaffolding. Mm -hmm. It's Same. It's awful. I also need to do another historical sidebar, because when he passed away, so tragically, his widow, Maria Mestre de los Dolores, Andro, which is an interesting... Am I translating that right in my head? Yep. Okay. Master of the pain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty great name. That's a good widow name. Sorry. I'm allowed to make that joke. I'm in the club. Um, but she was, yeah, so she was appointed keeper. And it was surprising, right, to have a female light keeper at this time. But the move was supported by the people of St. Augustine and very much by the press. And this made me happy as a fellow widow. I was just really glad that when her husband died, she wasn't then left destitute because, oh, I've been in that situation when you lose a spouse and then you're just, you're not sure if you're going to lose your house too. It's a lot to cope with. And Maria Andro, she is recognized by the Coast Guard as the first Hispanic American woman to serve in the Coast Guard or its predecessor services and the first command of federal shore installation. That's pretty um, progressive. It's pretty amazing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very progressive. So she served as the lighthouse keeper until the Civil War. Uh, you remember Florida was the third to join the Confederacy. And so in 1861, January 1861, the city customs collector removed and hid the lighthouse Fresnel lens to make it even harder for the American Union Navy to navigate. But eventually the Union Army did take the city and it happened fairly peacefully. The lighthouse was lit again on June 1st, 1867, but the eroding shoreline made it very clear that they needed to find a new location for a lighthouse and soon. Congress appropriated $100,000 for funding for a new lighthouse during Florida's reconstruction period. The U.S. Lighthouse Service began construction on a new 165-foot tower in 1871, and work was completed in 1874, when it was fitted with a new Fresnel lens, with 360 70 handmade prisms, which is still in use today, having been restored. According to the Lighthouse website, this is especially for our Lighthouse fans, quote, on October 15, 1874, Lighthouse Keeper William R. Russell lit the oil lamp inside the new First Order Fresnel lens for the first time. He most likely walked to the tower from his residence at the old St. Augustine Light Station, upon which the sea was rapidly encroaching. The lens is nine feet tall, and Russell would have had to climb inside it to light the lamps. The jewel-like lens was handmade just for St. Augustine in Paris, France, by the company of Sautier and Lemonnier. It represented the height of Victorian engineering and technology and cast its beam much farther out to sea than its predecessor. The new light now demonstrated three fixed flashes from three bullseye panels that could be seen from up to 19 to 24 nautical miles, depending on atmospheric conditions. Fueled by oil and then kerosene before electricity came to the light station, the original lens would have given off a brightly hued yellow light. Citizens living in town would would have immediately noticed, and many have remained interested in it ever since. On February 28, 1889, the St. Augustine Weekly News described the lens in the following manner, quote, The lamp was a brass cylinder of 10 gallons capacity. Inside, it has a heavy weight, which governs the flow of oil to the burner. The burner has five wicks in concentric circles. A chimney leads to the roof. It has a damper, which regulates the flame. The globe is a huge case of glass, which revolves around the lamp every nine minutes. It makes a flash every three minutes when a bull's eye lines up between the lamp and the human eye. The cage weighs two tons, end quote. I'm very glad you told us this, and I find it fascinating, and I have a feeling some of our listeners who appreciate our Victorian-era episodes will love the detail you put in there. I know. People like my husband and a lot of his friends, Paul's a mechanical engineer by training, so he's the sort of person that can just close his eyes and probably envision exactly what I'm talking about there. So, yeah, had to leave it all in. 
But building that second lighthouse was, of course, not without tragedy. So Hezekiah Pitty and his wife Mary, they had moved from Cape Elizabeth, Maine, down to St. Augustine with their children, Mary Adelaide, Eliza, Edward, and Carrie. So Hezekiah, which is kind of a great name, isn't it? The best, yeah. Love it. Yeah. I think I'm going to put it on the dog list. So he was the superintendent of lighthouse construction, and he lived on the property during construction, as did uh, many of the people working on the building. They had built temporary homes and things that would then be, you know, removed when it was done. Now, since the previous lighthouse had actually fallen into the sea, it's an archaeological site now, uh, they had built this new lighthouse a little further from the shore. Some people are surprised how far inland it is, but a small railway was constructed in order to help move supplies off the ships in the bay up to the building site. It wasn't close enough for just like a horse to pull a cart. You know, it's it's a little huh. bit of a distance. So Interesting. Yeah, they actually built like yeah. a little hand car railroad for supplies. And what they would use was a board basically at the end of the tracks would get fitted into place to stop the cart from just falling into the water. So... You probably can guess where this is going. Unfortunately, the pity children, as children definitely would have done, they used the construction site as a personal playground, as did their friends and the children of the other workers. And that cart, when it wasn't being used for supplies, was one of their absolute favorite things to play with. It was like their own little personal Victorian roller coaster. I'm going to go ahead and defer back to the Lighthouse website, which says, quote, On July 10th, 1873, the three Pitty sisters, Mary, 15, Eliza, 13, and Carrie, 4, along with an unknown African-American girl, 10, whose father may have worked on the site, were riding in the cart as normal. The wooden board that stopped the cart from going into the water was not in place. The cart carrying the girls flipped into the water, trapping the girls underneath. Mr. Dan Sessions, a young African-American worker, witnessed the event and raced to the water. When he reached the cart using all of his strength, he lifted it from atop the girls. By this time, three of the four girls had drowned. The only survivor was the youngest, Carrie. In the days after the accident, the construction site, as well as the town, shut down for the funeral of the girls. Following the funeral, the Pity family returned to Maine to lay their daughters to rest in their hometown. Staff researchers have not yet been able to find the final resting place of the young African-American girl. End quote. So that's incredibly sad. It's very sad. It's very sad and very upsetting. It's very, it's incredibly sad. And many people believe that those children are still around today. And they aren't the only spirits who call that lighthouse home. So are you ready for the ghost stories? I think I am. (laughs) I'm not sure. I know. It'll be fine. So funnily enough, I don't think I ever visited the lighthouse when I was living in St. Augustine. I went to plenty of parties near the lighthouse, which will never be discussed on the air. And I think my family all went. They would come down for Thanksgiving every year. They'd come down for the week and rent a condo for on the beach. Because when I was in college, I only got the Thursday. Thanksgiving is the Thursday and the Friday off. So it didn't make sense for me to fly home for four yeah. days. Yeah. But it was great. My parents would come down and they'd make a huge Thanksgiving dinner. And I would literally invite every single person I'd run into on campus. I'd just give them the address. And there was just people constantly coming in at a house and eating turkey and my parents were in heaven. So I'm sure they went when I was in class during the week. I didn't go until after I saw the episode about uh, the lighthouse on Ghost Hunters. And we'll talk about that episode later, which I'll link to. But I did end up going to the lighthouse with Paul and my wonderful mother-in-law, Valerie. And we took a lot of rests, but we made it to the top, which for me and my fear of heights is impressive. It's 165 feet high, as I'd said. And it really is. It's a really pretty lighthouse. It's got very distinctive black and white stripes. There are 219 steps that lead you to the top of the tower and the observation platform. And the steps are just... Just, it's like a cast iron, I think it's cast iron, circular staircase that just goes all the way up around, around, around. But the stairs themselves are are like a grate so you can look straight down, which I don't like at all. Mm -mm. But it is very pretty once you get to the top and it's stunning even if you're clinging, you know, once you're up there. (laughs) And it's haunted. Yes. 
So this is also from the Lighthouse website, but this is by Kelsey Lloyd. She's their special programs manager, and she writes about the Lighthouse's special tours that they do that are called the Dark of the Moon Ghost Tours. It's a good name. Isn't it? Dark of the Moon. I love it. Dark of the Moon Ghost Tours. I like that, yeah. So, Ms. Lloyd writes, quote, The grown children of the lighthouse keepers have told us that the home was a terrific place for Halloween parties and for telling ghost stories. So by offering the Dark of the Moon tours, we are proudly carrying on that family tradition. One story involves a relief lighthouse keeper living in the home in the 1950s who reported hearing footsteps upstairs. He went to investigate, but no one was up there. The head keeper at the time was James Pippin. He served from 1953 to 1955 and was the last keeper to live at the light station. Pippin initially lived at the keeper's house, as all the previous innkeepers had done, but he moved to the much smaller 1941 Coastal Lookout building, swearing that the, quote, big house was haunted and he would not stay another night in it, end quote. In 1955, the lighthouse lamp was fully automated and the United States Coast Guard replaced the lighthouse keeper with a position called lamplighter. The local lamplighter had all the duties of a lightkeeper, but did not live on site. As a result, the keeper's house was rented for a time. A local man who crafted leather goods rented the property during the 1960s. He tells the story of waking up one night with a small girl standing by his bed. As he blinked his eyes to look at her, she disappeared. End quote. So... Huh. That was actually something the girls in the room across from ours in college reported happening a lot, that they would wake up and see just a little girl in the room in period dress. Very Shining style. You like Kubrick, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you know, I love Kubrick, but I didn't, I wouldn't want to wake up. You don't want to wake up side. next to little ghost children with bows in their hair? Nah. Just... I think there's nothing scarier than little ghost girls or little ghost kids in general. Yeah. No, I think that I would be less afraid of seeing a child ghost than seeing, like, a full-grown man. Do you know what I mean? You know, because I have ghosts in my... Like, if I see a full-bodied apparition in this house, it would be less frightening to me if it was a kid than, like, a person. Because if they look real enough that you think it's a person, initially... Yeah. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. A small child, I'd be like, oh, what's... Hey, what's going on? Where's your mom? You know, where's, like... A man, I'd be like, oh, no, just different, you know, (laughs) different feelings. We actually had that, by the way, my place I lived with my friend Q for a while, this awful place. Our landlord had given her boyfriend the, who was like the handyman, keys to our apartment. And we would wake up and he'd be standing in our room staring at us. Yep. Good times. So anyhow, uh, Miss Lloyd goes on to explain that the lightkeeper's house had burned down under mysterious circumstances, and it left nothing behind except for the Coquina basement. There were a group of women volunteers that stepped in to save the property to raise money to rebuild the keeper's house, and they actually repaired and restored the original Fresnel lens that some asshole had shot. It had been damaged because somebody had shot it. The lens restoration was actually the first of its kind, but there's more. So she writes in the same piece, quote, During the renovation, both construction workers and the volunteers reported numerous unexplained incidents in the home. The basement was a particularly active area for ghostly encounters, being the only part of the home that had not completely burned. Perhaps the children like to play here? Today you can still feel a spooky presence there. While the children are by no means the only tragedy that occurred in the home, the girls are some of the most active spirits around. Psychics contact staffers frequently, and recently one told us that the young African-American girl's name was Ellie or Eleanor. We continue our archival research and hope to find historical evidence one day to confirm this information. The girls sometimes appear to people in fully formed apparitions. Several years ago, during the day, a guest was exploring the Maritime Hammock Trails and came upon a young girl in a Victorian outfit, sitting on a bench, reading a book. As she began to ask the girl a question, another group came up from the opposite direction. Distracted by the group, the woman looked away for only a moment and turned back to find the little girl on the bench gone. In a similar instance, a woman on a ghost tour approached another woman to compliment her daughter's behavior on the tour. Confused, the woman said she had no daughter. The other woman then told her that a little girl had been standing by her side for most of the evening. There were no children on the tour that evening. End quote. Jesus. I think that's the best kind of experience. That would be the dream, wouldn't it? No? 
That would be a nightmare. <laughs> Well, one person's dream is the other person's nightmare. That's true. I'll take, <laughs> I'll take care of all the Victorian child ghosts for you, honey. Someday, when, when we're touring the world and doing live shows in very small venues and sharing weird old hotel rooms, if ever there's like a Victorian ghost <laughs> situation, I will handle it. But wait, there's more. Other people that are thought to be haunting the lighthouse are one of the keepers, Peter Rasmussen, who was known for being meticulous and always having a cigar. So many people have reported the smell of a cigar, and it's believed to be him still watching over everything. Also, if you remember the keeper, Jose Andro, who had fallen to his death while painting the lighthouse, he's also been cited keeping watch on the tower. So I think people do actually see him and recognize him and like it's him. Staff report locking the door at the top of the lighthouse every night and finding it unlocked and open in the morning. There's an alarm system and motion sensors and a light will turn on at the top of the tower for safety if you trigger the motion sensor on the stairs, but there's never anything that triggers the security system. So they're not, they still don't know security, like the security companies looked at it and the security system works perfectly. So how does that door keep getting unlocked and opened? They, yeah. they don't know. Staff here talking or laughing at the top of the tower and they'll go up thinking they miss somebody, let them know they're closing and they need to get out and no one is there. Now, there's two interesting pieces of evidence that I've seen for the lighthouse that really impressed me. And if these have been proven fake and I just missed it, please let me know. The first is a photo I sent to you, Johanna, that seems to show a woman in a long dress with long hair standing on the observation deck uh, when the lighthouse was closed. I mean, it's impressive, but it's also like so cliche, don't you think? It is a little bit, but also... It's very cliche, yeah. Yeah. But is it cliche? Because that's the time... Do you know what I mean? Like, people always seem to see... I know. Well, what was there first, the chicken or the egg, right? Well, that's true. Fair enough. The other piece of evidence, it really gives me chills. So TAPS is the Atlantic Paranormal Society, and they are actually based, I think, in Warwick, Warwick, Rhode Island. And they had a television show that was really popular. Oh, I'm going to say I watched it a lot in like 2005, 2006. And so they go down to investigate and they find some interesting stuff, but I'm not going to recap an entire television show for you. I'll link to it so you can see. But what they caught appears to be the, so they have a camera at the base of the staircase in the lighthouse tower pointing up. And you see what appears to be the shadow of a man moving along the circular staircase. And then it pauses, looks over the railing, like very clearly looks like the head and shoulders of a person. And then you see it move very fast all the way to the top in like seconds. And then it stops and peers over again. And I've actually, oh, I got goosebumps just thinking about it because the investigators were in and out all night. And every time they got near the top of the lighthouse, the motion sensor would see them and a spotlight would turn on and illuminate the top of the staircase. And that light does not come on when you see this thing peering over at the top of you. So I don't know what it is, but I really, I like ghosts and I find it creepy. You see, and that's the thing, you sent me the video and I looked at it and I didn't recognize a head and shoulders. Well, you know what? The video I originally sent you was not the best. So I found another copy of it where it's okay. better. The one I first sent you, I was like, why does this look like it was taped on a VCR? Like the quality yeah, exactly. was really was like, pixelated. Hmm. No, I'll, the, I'll link to one where it's a much better, much better quality. We're going to take a look and let you know what I think. Yeah, it's creepy. <laughs> uh, it's, it's creepy. One of the theories is that the lighthouse maybe also attracts the dead from the many shipwrecks, which uh -huh. it's possible. I didn't even get into the pirate aspect. Aspects. And the reason I got so interested in into the history was first because it's fascinating and terrible in its own right. But also, of course, another theory uh, in terms of hauntings is that the more tragic history a place has, the more activity there would be. So like Rome should be more haunted than yeah. Antarctica. Yeah. Makes sense. Just a bunch yeah. of angry penguin ghosts and right, it makes sense. So whether you're a believer or not, those Dark of the Moon tours, they fund really important museum programs that are very science based and they also sell out very early, way in advance. So book early. I think, you know, it's not often that I'll say you have to do this ghost tour, but this one actually supports the preservation of the lighthouse and they're doing a lot of archaeological work underwater at the old lighthouse site and they have a great website. You'll you'll enjoy it. And um that's it. 
yeah, that's the story of the St. Augustine Lighthouse and the founding of St. Augustine. Thank you. I, it's fascinating, really. I had no idea. I've never been to St. Augustine. I've been to Florida. You know it. Mm-hmm. But I definitely want to go there next time I'm there. Yeah, I can't wait to show you around. You're going to love it. <laughs> You're going to love it. Uh, my something good this week is that now that I'm staying with my mom, I cook way more often. I love to cook. I really do. But when I'm living alone, I never do because it's just like... What's the point? What's the point? Yeah. But now I really love to cook and I'm cooking with my mom. Nice. Right often at the moment. And I bought a new air fryer. Well, not a new, I bought an air fryer. I never had one before and I love it. It's amazing. I even made bread with it. It's perfect. Nice. Wow. Now I want an air fryer. Are they healthier, the air fryer, or is it? Well, they use less oil. Okay. So still fried, but like healthier fried? It's like an oven. Oh, I think I want an air fryer. It's really good because it's super fast. The chicken was done in like 40 minutes. The bread was done in like 15 minutes because it's smaller and it gets hotter faster. I should get one for my dad. I keep meaning Mm. to get him like an Instapot. Good. Nice. So my something good, mine is actually going to be St. Augustine, Florida. Now, I know that we can't travel right now. None of us can. And it's tough. But eventually, things will open up again and things will be somewhat, we'll have a new normal, whatever it is, but we'll be able to travel again. And so I really want to recommend St. Augustine. There's something for everyone. There's dining and art galleries, history literally everywhere. The beaches are beautiful. It's great. Please tour the Leitner Museum, Flagler College, and the fort. One of the reasons that we chose to get married there is that there really are lodging options for every budget. So go walk around at the alligator farm, say hi to Gomek, who is still alive and kicking when I was haunting the area, so to speak. Please go to the lighthouse, take a tour. When you're on the island, have a meal at the Conk House. That was my favorite restaurant. They have these, it's on the water, on the marina, and they have an outside deck, and then they've built these little crow's nests over the water, like little tiki huts that you have to like walk up a ramp to get to. I just, I love that place. I'll be doing more episodes featuring St. Augustine, I'm sure, as it is really one of the most beautiful and the most haunted cities in America. To our overseas listeners or people who love a road trip, I would suggest a couple of nights in St. Augustine, and then it's only about a two and a half hour drive from St. Augustine to Savannah, Georgia. Stop in Fort Mose on your way, for sure. And then from Savannah, it's only about two hours to Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, I was really close then. Yeah, it's close. There, I, Anytime, I would be thrilled to go with you. Not in the summer, but like any other time, any other season. Because all three of those cities are just beautiful historic cities with a lots of ghosts. So they all have walking tours. If your joints are up to it, if they're not, they all have trolley tours. And St. Augustine is about two hours northeast of Orlando. So if you've got kids and you're planning a Disney and Universal trip, you could combine it with a trip to the parks and add beautiful St. Augustine. That's it. Sounds great. Thank you so much for listening. This one, I didn't mean for this one to be a historical episode, but sometimes that's just how it how it goes. Uh, so thanks again so much for listening. Come say hi in our Facebook group. We still need puppy names. We're looking for puppy names. I'm going to add Hezekiah to that list. Where else can they find us? Instagram, the Twitters. You can check out our webpage, freshhellpodcast.com. Yes. There you can find links to all of our sources. You can find links to our social media, to our voicemail, where you can leave us a voicemail, to our email, which is freshhellpodcast at gmail.com, to our merch store, where you get nice t-shirts and mugs and whatnot. People love that new design, too, in the merch store. It's not yet in a merch store, but it's going to be soon. It's amazing. So, (laughs) yeah. Please say hi to your pets. Give them a hug from us. We love them. They're very good. Very good boys and girls. Yes, absolutely. And until next week, as always, if you're going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye.